everybody. Thank you for coming. We're really pleased to have you here. My name is Carol Farley, and I have the unenviable task of introducing everybody today. Our sponsor, who is presenting this wonderful event, the New York Chamber Music Festival, is uh, Elmira Davarova who used to be the concertmaster of the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. She's a phenomenal violinist, as well as being the artistic director. And she and I dreamed up this whole event, Electra. Electra number two has fallen ill, so she will not be performing today. So we have one Electra today and two casts. So our wonderful Electra, who is named Amanda Zori, has agreed to be um, uh, Electra number one and Electra number two, which is an incredible feat. Even one is an incredible feat. So we're really, really grateful to her for being so great and doing it twice so that we can do a comparison between the two casts. I think that's all I'm going to say right now. This is our wonderful um, narrator, Scott Carlton, our fantastic collaborative um, pianist, Craig Ketter. So, without any further ado, we're going to be starting, and I turn it over to Scott Carlton, our wonderful there. Let us consider the house of Atreus. Of its ten immediate family members, six have been or will have been murdered by the end of our story. The victims include Atreus and his wife Aerope, their children Clytemnestra, Agamemnon, and Iphigenia, and the son-in-law and paramour of Clytemnestra, Aegisthes. It is Iphigenia who will be the catalyst for the bloodbath that is Richard Strauss's and Hugo von Hochmantal's telling of the myth. Seventeen years before our opera begins, Iphigenia was sacrificed in order to permit Agamemnon to leave for Troy. She was tied to an altar like a goat to have her throat slit. She, however, was transformed into a deer and may thus be said to have cheated death. This did not appease Clytemnestra who wreaks her vengeance upon Agamemnon upon his triumphant return to Mycenae seven years before the opera begins. She and her paramour Agistes murder Agamemnon with an axe, dragging his body into the courtyard of the palace of Mycenae. The daughter Electra lives only for the day when her father's death will be avenged. This obsesses her to the point of madness causing her to be spurned by her mother and by most of the court of the palace. She prowls the palace like a wild animal, obsessed with having her mother brought to justice. In the opening scene, servants attempt to cleanse the court of the palace. The servants taunt Electra and she insults them. Only one servant shows sympathy for Electra and she is taken away to be flogged. Electra enters to perform her daily ritual in memory of her father. She sings, alone, alas, all alone, and dreams of the day when her father will be avenged and of the triumphal dance she will enact upon the death of his killers. Her sister Chrysotemis enters the court and tries to reason with Electra and to convince her that a different life is possible. She does not wish to continue living a half-death in her own house and wants to leave, marry, and bear children. She sings, I cannot sit and stare into the darkness. She warns Electra that their mother, Clytemnestra, plans to lock Electra into a tower impervious to daylight. Electra scoffs and quizzes Chrysotemis as to where she may have heard of this plan. Chrysotemis says she heard it at the queen's door, and Electra screams that there is nothing to find in the palace but death.
Mistra now appears with a sallow, bloated complexion. She is covered with jewels and protective talismans, and her arms are covered with amulets. Her fingers bristle with rings. Her eyes appear abnormally large, and it seems to require superhuman effort for her to keep them open. Clytemnestra confides to Chrysotomus that she suffers nightmares every night, in particular nightmares of her own death at the hands of her son Orestes. She has not found a way to appease the gods and sings, I have no good nights. Oh, <laughs> 
subject turns to Electra's brother Orestes, and Clytemnestra reveals to Electra's horror that the gold she has sent for his support has not been used for this purpose, but for the purpose of having him killed. Thereupon, Electra reveals who is to be the real victim. It is Clytemnestra herself. She says the gods must be appeased once and for all, and that Clytemnestra will be chased through the palace like a hunted animal. The axe which killed Agamemnon will be handed to Orestes by Electra, and it will fall upon Clytemnestra. Only then will Clytemnestra's nightmare cease to haunt Electra. Clytemnestra laughs hysterically, mocking Electra, and leaves. Electra wonders at her mother's laughter until Chrysotomus comes to tell her that messengers have arrived with the news that Orestes is dead, trampled by his own horses. Electra, horrified, demands that her sister help her avenge her their father. Electra praises her sister and her beauty, promising that Electra shall be a slave at Chrysotomus' bridal chamber in exchange for her help in the deadly task. Chrysotomus fights off her sister, and Electra curses her. Electra, determined to carry out vengeance on her own, digs for the axe that killed her father. But she is interrupted by a mysterious man who enters the courtyard. He says he has a message for the mistress of the house, claiming to be a friend of Orestes, and saying that he was with Orestes at the time of his death. Electra collapses in grief, and the stranger guesses that she must be a blood relative of, Are of Orestes and Agamemnon. Gasping, Electra recognizes the stranger. It is not a stranger, but Orestes in disguise. Initially breaking into ecstasy, Electra withers in shame at what she has become and how she has sacrificed her own royal state for the cause of vengeance.
Agistes arrives, ecstatic at having heard the initial news that Orestes is dead. He says he wishes to speak to the messengers. Electra happily ushers him inside the palace, where he meets his fate at the hands of Orestes. He screams and calls for help, and Electra replies, Agamemnon can hear you. Chrysotomus comes out of the palace, stating that Orestes has killed Clytemnestra and Agistes. A massacre has begun with Orestes' followers killing those who supported Agistes and the Queen. Electra is ecstatic and begins to dance. At the climax of the dance, she falls dead to the ground. Banging on the palace door, Chrysotomus calls for her brother, but there is no answer. He has been pursued by the avenging Arrhenes, or Furies, who are tasked with the punishment of crimes such as matricide. Leaving Chrysotomus alone in the field of rubble and decay, that is the palace at Mycenae. <laughs>
That was drama. I mean, take it myself, I have to tell you. It was an incredible performance. Um, I want to give Electra a little moment to calm down after that, since she has to do it again. <laughs> if you can imagine, there are so many facets of putting a production like this together. We worked quite a lot, but we only got in to the stage today. So you can imagine that we haven't had much time to really stage it. However, the drama is in the music, and it carries it by itself. I look back myself, all the performances that I did of Zalome, which was, of course, the companion piece, really, of this opera, Electra. They're both 100 minutes long. And uh, once you get onto the stage, you don't leave it. So there's no exit. You, you go on and you stay on the whole time. And in many of my performances in Germany and other places, I had the great fortune of having Astrid Barnein as my Herodias, among other great Herodiases. And I just remember me watching her when I wasn't singing. And that's how I picked up all the things which I may have given to these singers. Um, really, you know, my years of experience watching other people and of course doing it myself. So I, um, I consider it a privilege to, to have done that. Another thing I wanted to point out is that these singers don't have the advantage of having lived in Germany and working in Germany as I did. So whereas Scott and I both um, speak German, they don't really speak German. So they have learned these roles without that uh, help of, of living in the country where you are performing, which is a big part of really uh, the performing of German opera. There are also other, other things which um, have helped these singers get through this performance. One of them if, is, of course, not having a conductor. This is, as you may know, one of the largest orchestras in the operatic repertoire, requiring about 110 musicians, including winds by four, extra brass, including uh, Wagner tubas, extra percussion, ex two harps, and tons of strings. So you have to have very piercing voices to be able to put across this. As you can hear today, I have them in spades here. We are very lucky. You could find these voices easily on any stage in the world today and think that you are lucky. So I count myself very, very lucky. And we have a second cast who is going to be completely different. And that was my way, uh, reason for putting two casts back to back so that you could compare how different each one could be. So the fact that we've lost one Electra, of course, uh, doesn't give us that advantage as far as she's concerned, but the rest of the cast, you will see a, a different staging and a different voice and, and a different way of looking at it, perhaps. And that's the whole point of this uh, comparison. So, without further ado, I think we'd better go on to the second cast.
think we really are incredibly fortunate to have these unbelievable singers. Mm -hmm. And there's very little. that I can or should say about them. However, I think we can talk a little bit about the process that they've had to go through to learn these roles, um, to master the drama involved in all of this, which is considerable, as you saw. The story, of course, tells itself, but I think if I were, if I were telling a singer, and I train singers all the time, and even though I'm a singer, I still learn every day. I think that's something that we all need to remember. I would tell them, for instance, with um, Electra's first monologue, which is called A Line Alone, I would tell them to start with it as a monologue and to speak it in English through, from beginning to end, to themselves, or out loud even. And then, once they have mastered that, then, once you know every single word, and it has to be every single word, you have to know every single word, not just the sense of what's happening in the scene, but every word means something. And it's important to know each one. So I would start learning by doing a monologue. And you can run each one of these scenes as a monologue, each one of the characters. Second of all, what I try to do is to picture what's happening in a scene in my mind. In other words, where is, in this case, where is Agamemnon? You have to figure out in your head. Um, Electra has a daily ritual, which she does to her father. Well, where does she picture Agamemnon? Where is he in her mind? He's no longer alive, but where does she see him? Is he there? Is he there? Where do you see each one of those things that you're referring to? That's important to know because um, for you to portray this character, you have to know exactly where it's coming from and where it's going. The other thing, we are very, very, very fortunate to have had a master uh, pianist. That a pianist can portray the whole orchestra with his fingers. And that's what Craig does. Craig, would you mind coming back to the stage? Because I would like to illustrate something about how one can listen to the orchestra. Um, if you have to find your pitch, for instance, how do you find your pitch? How, which instruments do you listen to at which times in the orchestra? In this particular score, we have what are called light motifs, and, and that means that there's a musical um, motif going on in the orchestra, which portrays Agamemnon. Maybe you'll give us the Agamemnon. Uh, you will have heard it. That's Agamemnon. And then you've got one for Chrysotomus. She is more of a character with sunshine. She's the only sympathetic character, shall we say, in this piece. And you get it in, in her music. Just play a little clip. You can just hear how much happier that is than the fully dramatic uh, previous Agamemnon. Uh, let's hear a tiny bit of Cleonestra. She's evil. <laughs> so that gives you a little bit of background on what those things are that you need to listen to. Then there are, of course, all of the technical things which we have to deal with, such as how to deal with this vocally, which is an incredible feat in itself, really. Uh, this is a very difficult score to sing, as you could have imagined. And just to master that musically is, is extremely difficult. And without a conductor, normally a conductor would be there to give you an entrance, but we don't have a conductor here today. So these singers have had to do that for themselves with the help, of course, of Greg here at the piano. So 
that's another thing that we've had to deal with. Of course, this story follows the plays based on Greek mythology. And now, that brings me to the next point, which is very interesting. I don't think in any other score a composer has taken a family. I mean, you could say this is like the Adams family, really. <laughs> the, the, the whole family is introduced one by one. First, Electra comes out. And then she does her monologue, and she she tells why she's upset, why she uh, does, does this ritual with her father. Then comes out uh, Chrysotomus, her sister, who is not at all like Electra. They're completely different in character. Then comes out Mommy, Lydia who has her own set of problems and has caused lots of trouble and whatever. And each person is is introduced by Strauss one by one, and you hear very clearly in the score uh, the differences in, in each one of those things. So I'd like to just maybe take a few minutes of each one of these scenes, and in the case that we have the double cast, I think it would be interesting for them to explain why and how they did what they did. So, singers, would you? We'll start with Amanda. Let's let's start with you. Yeah, would you come up and maybe we'll illustrate a tiny bit of do in your monologue. Not that you're going to sing the whole thing again. Oh. <laughs> I think you definitely put in your your uh, singing for today. Also, I want to talk a little bit about the German language, uh, the sung German language. One of the hardest things, really, and, and things which I've um, been talking to the singers about are the, the what are called the shababas, the final vowels in mutes um, words such as liba. Do you say it liba? Do you say it liba? Do you say it liba? what? How do you say it exactly? So, my feeling after living in in Germany for many years is to do to go towards the liba, as in sun, and you'll hear the difference if she would sing uh, a tiny bit. Fata is another word. Just So just, just start it. And we'll take a couple of those uh, vowels like that oh, as sure. a demonstration of what to do or what not to do. Okay. You just start it.
keep the resonance is what happens mm -hmm. there. You keep the resonance so that it stays in the same place. If you drop out of that adjustment, then you lose the focus of the sound, and it doesn't sound as good, and it doesn't sound as German. So that's what we're doing. Okay. So that's just one example of what we're what we're working with 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 vowels and consonants. Another thing is the consonants. Each one of the consonants. Und wir schlachten dir die Rosse. For instance, it's a good example. Und wir schlachten dir die Rosse. which is another important thing, uh, which I stress a lot with my singers, the dynamics of how to go from the beginning of the phrase to the end of the phrase. And by not giving your whole voice the whole phrase, but if you, if you uh, leave some of the voice to get to the end of the phrase, because that's where the line is going. And Strauss is a master of vocal lines. Um, his... Uh, his, especially for women's voices, but you will have heard lots of beautiful lines for, for men as well today, for Orestes. Um, his projection of characters, the vocal lines in Strauss are absolutely magnificent. So all of these singers, every single one of them, demonstrated that today, and that was really a, a beautiful thing. So that's another thing of how we learn to, to do these things. Now, the characters. Ele Electra, especially, has a lust for revenge. Um, we didn't have the time to fully um, develop all these characters. Uh, for instance, when I did a produ production in Germany, I spent usually six to seven, sometimes eight weeks, eight hours a day, every day, six days a week, working with a a stage director on what we're going to do. And if you have that much time, you can really figure out the interaction of these characters, which is really important. Each one of these characters has um, a relationship with the father, the mother, the sister, the brother. These are all important things, and it takes time to figure out what you're going to do with each one of these things. So um, that's another thing that we uh, deal with. Uh, I think we had enough of you. Now. Thank you. Let's go. <laughs> Thank you, brother. imagination of uh, um, stopping her nightmare, she doesn't realize that as much she uh, using these rituals, the more uh, she become to be like uh, crazy about nightmares. And these nightmares uh, change her life because she's afraid of everything. She's, she's uh, tried to get rid of it because she doesn't sleep at all. Uh, and uh, um, like it's like a circle. She's in a circle. Uh, she tried to uh, do these rituals. She doesn't sleep. More rituals, and finally she's. Hey, Laka, don't don't get me wrong. 
because it's all drama. Drama, a personal that a uh, singer can perform and play, um, because it's not only about singing, especially in Clitonesca. It's more about character. And it's more crazy character, it's more interested in singing. This, this, I, I never done it before, so I enjoy it. Really enjoy it with crazy stuff. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> that's why we're here. Okay, so that's your version. Yeah. Now, Caroline, what is your version? Mine's a little different. <laughs> As you can probably tell. Um, it was funny. The first thing that came to my brain when I started thinking about her was the Edgar Allan Poe story, The Telltale Heart, where she could hear the heartbeat, he could hear the heartbeat in the floor of the person he killed. And I like the idea of it just like the drip, drip, drip of the sanity falling away as you can't get it out of your brain. And then I like the idea of her queen. So she wants to have the regal facade. She's doing her best to make sure everybody thinks that everything's fine. But the, the reality and the truth is bleeding through. So, you know, I, I did the idea of like, like with my costume, I, I put in like a crown, but the hair can't quite keep itself together. And, you know, I'm putting on the makeup, but it isn't quite good enough. You know, like that idea of her doing her best to mask the insanity that's slowly uh, taking her over. Um, and so that was the idea of me just trying to rein in the thing that I can't control. So that was sort of my dramatic uh, theory behind the character. Okay. You can see that it's quite different, but it's the same character, and you still get, I don't know if you get the same effect, but you still get this craziness, but each one is looking at it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. That's why mm -hmm. the drama is so interesting, as Strauss has said this story. It's so interesting because if you look at it through a different lens, you'll get a different picture, but it's the same character. So how do you portray this character is a very uh, important, uh, extreme importance in, in choosing what it is you're going to do with the character. So thank you, ladies. Thank you. We're going to saying first, so tell us your concept. So, for me, the way that I was approaching Kazanas is we have this very unique way in, in that we've all been going a little stir crazy during COVID. We've all had to find our center. We've all been isolated. We've all needed to kind of dig deep and find what it is that allows us to go through every day. And with Kazanas, I feel like the relationship with Electra is extremely important. I feel like because I've been so intimidated and cowed by my sister that I have almost given up hope. And how can I show that she has enough to kind of get through the day, but at the same time to show that she is very damaged? Um, so I started thinking about repetitive motions and um, using my hair in particular, thinking about how um, kind of the, the comfort that would come from having um, not a lot around me that was supportive and having to kind of support myself. So I found that COVID was very helpful um, in an unusual way as I was approaching the character. Okay, great. Sangeeta. Yes. Um, for me, Kazanis was just the one with desire and heart, and um, she she is always lives in a world of optimism and dreams in this really dark and murderous and gray <laughs> environment, and literally living not being able to leave her home. And she still is the one like ray of hope, like that she that almost breaks through. We don't know what that is. <laughs> and so, yeah, and it's, these, and it's the most simple desires that bring this warmth and light, um, wanting to have babies and a beautiful life. And at this point, she doesn't care who it's with, you know? <laughs> 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 
Anybody, anybody <laughs> walking on the street, yeah. <laughs> well, she hasn't got that much choice, let's, let's face it. She's in a pretty damp and, and uh, difficult environment, but anyway, yes. So that's uh, quite a different approach, as you can see, to them. Uh, unfortunately, Ores, we don't have your counterpart here for, for you to um, uh, explore how it might be different, but maybe, thank you ladies, maybe you'd like to come up and tell us. Michael, thanks so much. Do so you want to give us an impression of what you think of Ores? Uh, well, I can think of Ores, or I can think of how I approach him. Yeah, or um, both. Uh, or Ores? From the standpoint of, uh, at the very end, I have to tell you, at the very end of the piece, when I'm supposed to get the axe, right? I feel like a big Sweeney Todd moment. Like I'm supposed to take the axe and go, at last my right arm is complete again, and then go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the story goes on. Yeah, the story goes on. <laughs> so, um, for don't me, get when, away. I, when, I, when I go into the, the libretti and I was trying, looking at the text and trying to say, What's happening in the scene that I need to react to? So as opposed to saying, you know, what is the character that I'm bringing into the scene? What does the scene tell me the character is? And there were two moments in it. One where um, there's a line that Electra says, something about um, stop touching my dress and stop looking at it with my, those eyes. And another one which was, you know, no, you must not embrace me now. So those were two physical beats in the scene where the character needs to react to a moment. And that's why I tried to build the connectors between those. So that when he comes in and he's not recognized, why is he not recognized? Is he not recognized because of a costume? In, in disguise or lighting, what else? What, something is causing him not to be recognized. And it may be that he's not when he left he was soft and now he returns and is very hard and rigid. So then I tried to build that aspect of As the been a change, in other words. Yeah, not only physically, but also trying vocally to make sure that he's very bodily and stern and stately. Mm -hmm. And that then when he starts transitioning to the brother, that there can be that not only a physical change, but an uh, uh, emotional. A, emotional and a lyrical yeah. change to the voice a little bit. Yeah. Um, oh, and, oh, I don't understand. Dogs. dogs, yes, absolutely. Good analogy. The dogs recognize him, but the yeah. sister does not. Yeah. And then, and, and and that's a telling. The first time through, I tried to do it just exclusively with, you know, standing there, hey, I'm right here. And then the second time I went through, I went, you know, what happens if I, if he's Clark Kent, and suddenly I take my glasses off and I'm Superman. <laughs> but this time I took my jacket off and suddenly, <gasps> There's a rest, and I can finally recognize him because he's taken off that armor and right. that physical. And so I tried to try to build it. I'm, I work personally very much outside in. So what does the what does the score tell me? What does the music tell me? Um, you know, what is Craig giving me? You know, if Craig is giving me anger, don't fight that. Let, yeah. let Strauss have given you anger and, and cuddle into that. But when it gets very lyrical and a much longer line, then you can also cuddle with that and use that as a point. Of course, cuddle with that, sure. Excellent. Very good. Good point. Now, the last thing I would like to demonstrate is the death of Electra, which has a number of problems with it. Um, staging problems, and we staged it, for, we had only one rehearsal of all of us together at Opera America on, was it Thursday? Yeah, Thursday night. That was our only run through of this whole show until today. And of course we worked individually and in groups and duets and that and so on, but that was our first chance to run the show from beginning to end. I'm just trying to give you an idea, a picture of what exactly how we put this together. So, Amanda, if you wouldn't mind coming to the stage again with uh, a chrysotomus. Okay, so this is how we're going to stage the death. This is the last page of the opera. And a lot, yeah, let's get rid of that stage. Um, a lot is is going to happen in, in less than one page. So I thought it'd be interesting to, to demonstrate what exactly happens. So 
Craig, would you play the two death chords so that the, the listeners can hear what this sounds like? So she has got to die on those chords. So are we going to make her die on the first chord? Or are we going to delay it until the second chord? Which is what we did in this particular instance. She fell on the first chord. And then she lost her breath, so to speak. And then she actually died on the second chord. So if we could just demonstrate that, it might be interesting for the public to see exactly how that works. Also, what is, what's happening in her mind? Where is she focused as she falls? What is she thinking about? What do you think? Oh, Agamemnon. Yeah. My Faja. Yeah. Here I come. Yeah. We've won. Yeah. We've done it. We've done it. We've done it. We've got it. We've got it. Oh, yeah. So, that's, it's a that's what you want to come up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a so, good one. Yeah. So can we just show that? It's, it's all about the timing in this. And it's all about the obsession that has to come out. And you finally have gotten with your father. So let, that all has to come out at the same time, only on those, in, the, in this very last page. So let's just do the whole last page. If you don't mind, I'll take it. so that the public understands that. Can we try it one more time? Yeah. <laughs> Carefully. Okay. No accidents. So uh, 
enough time. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us today, everybody. artists with us, you are going to, I hope, see these artists on the stages where they belong in the world, because every single one of them really belongs there. We have little details to work on still, but these are your true vocal artists of the day, because their voices actually work really well, as you heard. Mm -hmm. So, thank you to all of them. Thank you for coming. And that was a look at Electra. Woo!